Hey everyone, Dr. Armagani here today to talk to you about the cervical laminoplasty. This is a procedure performed through the back of the neck to help remove any spinal cord compression. If you have severe compression of your spinal cord, you may be experiencing symptoms such as balance and coordination problems or clumsiness with your hands. For more information on what the symptoms of severe spinal cord compression are, please see my educational video regarding cervical myelopathy found in the links below. There are many different ways to treat this particular condition, and you want to have a knowledgeable, experienced surgeon to help you make the best decision possible. The most common surgery performed in the United States in the back of the neck, the laminectomy infusion, uses rods and screws to stabilize the bones of your neck, but limits motion significantly. The laminoplasty, on the other hand, is one of my favorite procedures to perform because it is what we call motion sparing. This procedure isn't for everyone, but if I can keep a patient's neck moving versus not moving, that's what I want to do. In this video, we will be discussing the normal anatomy of the neck, as well as step-by-step step how I perform this procedure from beginning to end. At the end of the video, I will discuss the risks, expected recovery, and any post-operative restrictions we may have. If you want to skip around to different sections, please see the timestamps in the description below to find the parts of the video that most interest you. Now that we have an overview of the video, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, now that we're in, let's talk about the cervical laminoplasty. Before we get started though, we should have a little bit of an understanding of the basic anatomy of the cervical spine. This particular picture is a view from the back of your neck. Let's take a look at where these anatomic landmarks are one by one. The spinous process is going to be highlighted here in red. The spinous process is the bone that you can actually feel when you're touching the back of your neck. An extension of the spinous process that extends downward and covers your spinal cord is called the lamina, highlighted here in blue. The lateral mass is the outermost extension of the lamina, and it's what connects your bones together. There is no spinal cord where the lateral mass is. The spinal cord is only contained in the area that is covered by the lamina here in blue. The nerve roots are going to be highlighted here in black. Between each vertebrae, a set of nerve roots come out on the left and right side and go down your arm and upper back into very specific areas, which helps give you sensation, strength, and can also generate pain. Moving on, this is going to be a view from your side. So up top here, you're going to have where your skull and brain are, and down at the bottom is going to be where your feet are. Off to the left is going to be the front of your neck, and on the right side here, this is going to be the skin of the back of your neck. Let's take a look at these anatomic landmarks one by one as well. The disc, which is the cushion material that's between the vertebral bodies, is highlighted here in blue. The vertebral bodies are going to be these bones on either side of the disc. Next, we have the vertebral artery, which helps take blood from your heart all the way up to your brain. It's very important for us to know where these structures are during surgeries. The nerve roots are highlighted here in green, and you can also see how the nerve roots come out in between two vertebrae. So you have this nerve root here that's coming out between this vertebrae and this vertebrae, and then you have this nerve root here that's coming out in between this one and this one above that's slightly obscured. The spinous processes are highlighted here in yellow, and you can see how they do protrude out a little bit. So if you are trying to touch the back of your neck from this side, this is going to be the first bone that you're going to feel. Lastly, we have the facet joint highlighted here in purple. This is the connection between both vertebrae. So if you have a vertebrae here and here, this purple line is going to be the joint that is between these two vertebrae. These joints allow your neck to have motion in many different planes. This is going to be a view from the top. So you have the skin of your back of the neck up top here, and then the front of your neck down at the bottom. Going through these structures one by one, we find the disc highlighted here in blue. This is a cushion material that is between your vertebrae that helps keep your range of motion. The vertebral artery is highlighted here in black. It's very important for us to know where these are during surgery to help keep you safe. The nerve roots are highlighted here in green, coming off of the spinal cord, which is in purple. Lastly, protecting the spinal cord is going to be the spinous process and lamina together. And again, you can see that if you're touching the back of your neck, this tip of the spinous process is going to be the first thing that you feel. Now let's see what happens if we take a cut right through the middle of your neck. This is the view that we get. For orientation purposes, 
The left side of the screen is going to be where the front of your neck is, and the right side of the screen is going to be where the back of your neck is. The spinous process and lamina is highlighted here with my laser pointer, and the vertebrae are here in white on either side of a disc, which is here in red. The spinal cord is in the middle. And you can see that there is space between the vertebrae and the spinal cord, as well as the spinal cord and the lamina and spinous process here highlighted in white. A degenerative cervical spine looks significantly different than the last view we just saw. Let's take a look at some of those features. In a degenerative cervical spine, you see disc height loss. So in here, the red, the disc, isn't as tall as it once was. As a result of the disc height loss and degeneration, you start to see bone spurs form. The bone spurs form in the front of the vertebral bodies, as well as in the back of the vertebral bodies. You can see though, as a result of the bone spurs forming into the back of the vertebral body, it starts to compress the spinal cord a little bit. That leads us to disc bulging, which also occurs as a result of degeneration. So, in total, you have the bone spurs, the decreased height, and the disc bulging all contributing to spinal cord compression in this example. Let's take a look at the degenerative cervical vertebrae from the top view. Now, to remind you, the disc is highlighted here in red, spinal cord in yellow, and the spinal canal, or the space for the spinal cord, is in this dark area here. This spinal cord has significant space in this example. But look what happens once the spine becomes degenerative. You start seeing some changes. The disc starts bulging a lot more. You start seeing bone spurs form, and as a result of the disc height loss, bone spurs, and disc bulging, you have the spinal cord have significantly less space than before. You can tell that that rim that was around here for the spinal canal isn't present. The reason why it's not present is because of the disc bulging and bone spurs that have occurred as a result of disc degeneration. So a degenerative spine can lead to spinal canal narrowing, which we call spinal stenosis. Let's take a look at these two examples below. On the left side, you have your normal cervical spine. You don't have any degeneration here. And look how big the spinal canal is. The spinal canal is measured from the disc space out to the very beginning of the spinous process and lamina. It looks quite large here. However, in a degenerative spine, when you do see some of that disc bulging and bone spurs, look at what the size of the canal should be and what it actually is. So this is how big this canal should be when compared to the normal view. But you can tell that the canal size is actually only from this disc space to about here. So you're missing this whole amount of space for your spinal cord. It is very compressed in this example. Let's take a look at what the normal spine looks like from the top view. Highlighted here in blue is the size of the spinal canal, again extending from the very beginning or end of the disc all the way to where the spinous process is. Now let's see what happens in a degenerative spine. Because of disc bulging and bone spur secondary to disc degeneration, you can see that the size of the canal is much smaller than it would have been if it was a normal spine. You have a space problem. You do not have enough space in your spinal canal for your spinal cord. And we're able to see that here in this degenerative spine. Because of the bone spurs and disc bulging, you have spinal cord compression. As a result of that, the spinal canal is quite small. However, after surgery, we're able to make your spinal canal this big. You can now see that there is not significant compression of the spinal cord because of the bone spurs and disc bulging. Let's get into how we do this step by step. Before we start with the laminoplasty, let's just go over one more anatomic fact. This is the back view again, the view looking at you from the back of your neck. Your head is going to be up top and your feet are at the bottom. The lateral masses are highlighted here in green. Remember what I said earlier, the spinal canal is between the lateral masses. So outside of the border of where this lateral mass begins, this is going to be all bone. But in between here and here is going to be your spinal cord underneath. This is the area by which we need to expand your spinal canal. We start out by cutting your bone completely all the way through to the spinal cord, right at the edge of where the spinal canal begins, because over here is going to be the spinal canal, and over here is going to be the lateral mass. So we're going to take our high-speed burr, which is the instrument by which we do this, and we're going to basically cut right down this line, which is, again, the very outside margin of the spinal canal. 
So we've cut through that completely. And let's look at this now from the top view. This is the view looking at you from the top down. The back of your neck is here and the front of your neck is down at the bottom. We again have to cut completely through one side of the bone all the way down to your spinal cord at the very edge of the spinal canal. So here's going to be our line here, which denotes the very outside edge of the spinal canal. You can tell that because outside of this line, you see just white bone here. This is going to be the lateral mass. But inside of that black line is going to be all the area, which is your spinal cord. So we're going to go ahead with our instrument here and our burr, and we're going to drill right through the bottom. Our next step is to actually cut partially through your bone on the other side, right at the edge of the spinal canal. The reason why we want to do this is we want to take the spinous process and lamina, which is covering the spinal canal, and we want to basically open it up like a door. So we're going to open this as a door, open this bone as a door, and open that bone as a door. If you think of the door as having a hinge, which does not go all the way through like this side, it has an opening as well, which is all the way open on this side. So the door is gonna open on this side and it's going to hinge off of this side here in red. Let's take a look at how that's done. So we're gonna take our burr and we're gonna go partially through the other side. Let's take a look at this same cut through the top view. Again, we do not want to go all the way through here. We want to make that hinge. So here is going to be our cut in red. Notice how it is not all the way through. It's only partially through. So we'll take our burr and we'll go partially through each vertebrae on the way up. Now that the bone is cut partially on both sides, our next step is to take a very small curette, which is a special instrument that we use, and we try to open that door up. Remember, this side had us cutting all the way through and this side we were cutting partially through so if you imagine this whole triangle here as a door we're going to open the door on this side and the hinge is going to be over on the other side let's take a look at how this occurs so we're going to lift up gently continue lifting and continue opening that door and now you can see this whole cut side is completely open this is the side we were able to open that door from the hinge is going to be over here. The hinge stays intact because we did not cut all the way through that bone. This now creates a ton of space for your spinal cord. To secure this in place, we have to put a kind of kickstand in. The reason why we can't just leave this is because if we remove this curette, this bone will just close again. Think of this plate as the doorstop that you keep in the door to keep it open. So what we'll do is we'll slowly slide this plate in, and you can see how it fits perfectly right into this cut edge of bone here, holding it almost like an alligator mouth, and it stays hinged right on the outside part of the lateral mass here. This keeps everything intact and holds that door open as we created more space for your spinal canal. Now that we have the plate in place, you can slowly start seeing the spinal cord drifting backwards off of the compression from the bone spurs and the disc out here in the front. You can see that there is white now on all sides of the spinal cord, showing that there is no longer any compression of the spinal cord. Let's look at that same animation though from the back view. Remember, in black, we cut all the way through the bone. This is going to be the opening of the door. And in red, we cut partially through the bone. This is going to be our hinge. So when we bring in our curette, we're going to lift up at each vertebrae level to open up that door. And you're going to see this here, and it opens up a little bit. Then we open it up more, and then we open it up more. But we've done this at one, two, three four different areas. Because we did this at four different areas, we need four different kickstands to hold that door open. So we have four different kickstands holding open four different doors. This creates a huge amount of space in your spinal canal for your spinal cord. These are our final images. On the right side, you have the view from the top down. You see that the spinal cord is no longer compressed at all by the disc bulging and bone spurs down here in red. You have a nice white rim on all sides of the spinal cord, and that's because we were able to open the door of this bone here and hold it open with this black kickstand. 
This over here on the left is going to be the view from the back to show you that we open up the door four different times. There are four different doors that we need to open to create more space for your spine and nerves. In some patients, we may only need to do two or three of these. In other patients, though, we may need to do all four. We make that judgment based on what your MRI looks like, and we discuss it with you preoperatively. To remind you of what things looked like before, here's a picture of the top view before we did surgery. You can see how compressed the spinal cord is because it's laying right on top of this disc and bone spurs, and there's not much space behind it. After surgery, however, you can see how much more space there is for the spinal cord. There's now white on all sides because we opened this door and held it open with this kickstand. And that's step by step how I perform the laminoplasty. Let's cover some common questions that I hear. What are the risks of this procedure? Neck pain is very common following this procedure. Think about it this way. We have to make an incision about this big in the back of your neck. And in the process of trying to get to your bones, we do have to move some of those muscles off to the side. In the process of doing that, that can cause some neck muscle damage. We do sew those muscles together afterwards, but it does take time for those muscles to heal. The neck pain can last for up to a month, but can rarely be long term. Infection can occur as well. Because we're making an incision in the back of your neck, we do have to have those muscles heal back together. Occasionally from time to time, because of the location of the incision, patients may have wound problems or get an infection. This is exceedingly rare though. Less than 2% of patients do have these problems. However, patients that are at increased risk for this have obesity, diabetes, or are smokers. We try to counsel patients prior to undergoing this procedure if they're one of those three about these risks. Nerve injury is also a risk. Your spinal cord has been compressed for a very long time, and as a result of your spinal cord being compressed a long time, the nerve roots which extend off from the spinal cord have also been shortened a bit. In the course of about a couple hours, we're able to do this procedure and your spinal cord actually drifts backwards off of any of the compression that it may be having. As a result of this, what can happen is those nerve roots, which are very, very short to begin with because it's been compressed for so long, can be stretched temporarily. As a result of this, you may experience weakness lifting your arm out like this or doing a bicep curl. That can last for about a year, but tends to come back with physical therapy. It is rare that this occurs though. Less than 8% of patients have this occur. This could occur up to three days after surgery though because of the stretch. Less than 1% of the time, in the process of making those bone cuts with our high-speed burr, we may get a small hole within the fluid-filled sac which holds the spinal cord. That causes a spinal fluid leak. If that occurs, I attempt to fix it right there, but we may have to keep you in the hospital another day or two to ensure it's not continuing to leak. Need for reoperation is another risk. This is something that can occur because of an infection that we have to go back to the operating room to clean more thoroughly, or because there's a problem of the metal that we put into your neck. What's the recovery like following this procedure? Generally, patients are staying one to two nights in the hospital and then going home with family assistance. You will have neck pain for at least a month though because of the dissection that's needed to complete the procedure. This is a stiff soreness type pain that extends from the base of your neck into the top of the shoulders. This does tend to improve after about a month, but a lot of patients sometimes do have some amount of long-term pain just as a result of us having to go through the back of the neck. One thing that I tell all my patients following surgery is that the goal of the surgery is to halt progression of your symptoms. We do not want you worsening from the time that you've had surgery to any other point in your life. By taking the pressure off of the spinal cord, we then allow your body time to start healing things. Any improvement that you may experience is a bonus, but only about a third of patients end up seeing improvements. The other thing I tell patients is that the nerves take about one year to go through the healing process. The spinal cord can take even longer at times, so there's no snap judgments on this surgery, but how you feel at one year to two years is going to be how you're going to feel long term. Give your body time to heal. The spinal cord and nerves have been compressed for a very long time and they need time to recover. 
Lastly, there's no brace needed for this surgery. I do give patients the option of having a soft collar, which can help with some of the neck pain and discomfort that you can have following surgery. Because this is a motion sparing procedure, we don't want to limit your motion with having a hard collar on. We want you to move around. What can I do post-op? It's okay for you to remove the bandage that you leave the hospital with in three days, and then you can shower normally without the bandage. All of your stitches are going to be on the inside and covered with butterfly strips unless you are stapled. If you have staples in place, you can also shower after three days. Simply let soap and water run down the back of your neck and pat it dry afterwards, putting a new bandage over the top for about the first week or two until we know that the incision has started to heal. The other thing is we want no reaching or lifting greater than 20 pounds for about six weeks. The reason why we say no reaching far out in front of you or reaching far above your head is because your muscles in your neck are held tightly together with stitches as they heal. The healing process for the muscles takes about six weeks. If you're reaching frequently far in front of you or high above your head, you may be slowing the recovery and healing of the neck muscles. Following six weeks though, you have no restrictions and then we can start physical therapy. It is okay for you to walk as much as you want. We want you to be walking because then you can start working on some of those balance and coordination issues which have likely been giving you a problem as time has been going on. From a pain management perspective, we want to minimize the amount of prescription pain medication that you take. We do this by having you alternate taking Tylenol 1000 milligrams three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and then a few hours later taking ibuprofen or your favorite anti-inflammatory two hours afterwards. So for example, at 8 o'clock, you would take a Tylenol. At 10 or 11, you would take an ibuprofen. In the afternoon around lunchtime, you would take another Tylenol. Then in the mid-afternoon, an ibuprofen. In the evening, you take a Tylenol. And then a few hours later, you would take an ibuprofen. Even though you may think that these medications aren't giving you a lot of pain relief, they are giving you a background level of pain relief so that you don't have to take as many prescription pain medications and muscle relaxers which will provide for you after surgery. And then a few hours after taking the Tylenol, take ibuprofen 600 milligrams also three times a day. That way you're taking some sort of medication six times a day to minimize the amount of narcotic that you would need to take or the muscle relaxer that you need to take. Generally, my patients aren't taking narcotics greater than six weeks following this procedure. Thanks a lot. And there you have it, the cervical laminoplasty. Hopefully after this video, you have a better understanding of the anatomy of the neck, step-by-step -step how I perform the procedure, and what to expect postoperatively. If you're curious about the conditions that can be treated with this particular procedure, see the links below. To have a consultation with me regarding your spine, you can find our office phone number in the description below if you're on YouTube, or you can click book an appointment above if you're on our website, www.armaganispine.com. You can also find me on these other platforms, and if you're on YouTube, please comment, hit like, and subscribe to be notified about future educational videos such as this one. Take care.